as a writer, do you have to be sort of prepared to kind of like be prepared to fall almost, to write what potentially is going to be rubbish and you're not going to use, but be prepared to make those mistakes in in the event that you'll when you go back over it, you'll have made something better in the end. Do you yeah, need to allow yourself that freedom? Yeah, I mean, you 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 always know when you're going through that you're potentially making mistakes and you just sort of sometimes stick a pin in it and just keep writing to, to just see where maybe you can sort of bring it back on side later on and you need to be able to sort of take your first stab at the canvas and then step back and look at it and see what what's working and what isn't um, and at the point at which you hand the script in to producers or executives they'll give you a hand figuring out the, the, the failures that are there because sometimes you've, you've failed and you haven't realised it. You're effectively, as a screenwriter, you are the god of your own world. Uh, and it's not easy being god because there's a lot to think of when you're god. Um, so you think that you've thought about something really important and you've got this great story and someone comes in and says, uh, God, you haven't thought about that. And you're like, oh, goodness, yeah, I'm not a good enough God. Um, so that's, that's what you really need is for other people to sort of help you flesh out as rich a world as you possibly can before you shoot. And you, you often hear that actors give their characters a backstory, a, a biography. Do you as a screenwriter so that you really understand the character that you've written and, and the given the sort of the character gravitas, do you do that as well? Uh, I think to an extent, yeah. I think some screenwriters are really religious about doing that and others are not. Uh, I try and do the minimum possible because I'm aware that doing that can become a bit of a sort of research cul-de-sac where you just sort of end up having fun creating all these backstories and doing all this research and you never actually write the script. So I, I like to sort of wing it a bit more and just um, get the best out of what I know. And when I hit a, a wall and I realise that the, the only way out out, the one only way through the war is to go back into a character's backstory and come up with something more interesting that's when I'll do that um, so uh, you know and, and very often I think actors come in and they complete the process because actors have more need of a specific backstory to their character my job is to do the entire story so it's not that I'm not interested in my characters I'm deeply interested in them um, but you you have to just moderate the amount of backstory you go into and, and with regards to kind of like the exposition of the story, what do you sort of take into consideration? Is it, is it the dialogue? Are you thinking, again, you've mentioned, you think with pictures. So are you thinking about how these scenes are and how this story is going to move forward? What, what do you take in mind for that? Well, I think that um, the story beats are all the, all the thing, anything that can move a story forward. And every time you have a need to get the story from point B to point C, you have a choice to move that forward in dialogue or in action description. Um, so you just have to make that decision. And because you know the, the big rule in screenwriting is show, don't tell, you're always biased towards showing it, and that's a good thing. But there are times when you've got no option but to tell, or maybe you've just been showing a lot for the last five pages of a script and it's time to do a bit of telling. Um, so you just have to figure it out. You know, For example, if you've got a backstory, do you have a character tell another character, oh, this person used to have you know, that trauma in their background? Or do you show it in flashback um, or mention it in voiceover? There's a number of choices. So they're all subjective. There's not necessarily one right way to go. You just have to try what you think is best. And if it doesn't work, switch to something else until it feels like it, it fits. And with regards to the visual transitions between scenes, is that something that you write into your script or is that something that you leave to the discretion of the director? Sometimes. Uh, I mean, this is the thing. When you see a finished film, you're seeing the, the, the fruits of uh, a whole bunch of creative choices that anywhere between one and ten writers have made. Um, and a whole bunch of interpretive choices that a director has made on top of that and some ideas of the actors thrown in there and the producers all sort of stirred together. And it's really hard to tell. Sometimes it can be, you know, if it's, if it's a particularly visionary writer-director and he's got a very clear idea of what he wants, you know, say James Cameron and Avatar, you're probably looking at a story that is 98% James Cameron and 2% stuff his actors came up with. Other times, uh, you know, there's so many different writers that you could you could split down one percent <laughs> between all the different people making a movie. It's very hard for an audience to tell. Um, 
but you know, we're we're magpies, really. I think filmmakers are magpies, and we'll, best idea wins. We'll take an idea from anywhere. You know, if the T boy comes up with a great idea, we'll throw it in there. <laughs> it's always been open to it, isn't it, really? Yeah, I think so. And 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 so you know, when you are directing, as as I found when I was directing Exam, it's 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 not about having a bunch of people there to. Uh, to turn your every idea into reality. The, the, the goal is to bring a whole bunch of people in to make the vision you have even better um, and to, to be the referee of the best ideas that are coming at you um, because you can always say no. Um, but why would you want to shut yourself off to a bunch of really good ideas? And uh, on, on exam, my, my cast and crew are coming up with great ideas every day. It's just a case of being able to think on your feet enough to take that idea, um, rehearse it and shoot it and have it, you know, merge in with your script so that it doesn't sort of stick out like a sore thumb. Sometimes everyone, including yourself, can get completely caught up in what you think is a great idea on set. Um, and then you realise the next day that actually it doesn't quite fit because of that scene on page 39. And you have to go back and <laughs> change things. So um, you, you, uh, you have to be very open, but you also have to, to have a certain amount of cautious conservatism about your script because um, you don't want to sort of let improv in the moment sort of take you too far off, off track. And there's a whole span of directors from directors who love to to do improv, to other guys like Hitchcock who planned movies to within an inch of their lives um, and brooked almost no improvisation. Um, and it's hard to say that any one way is right or wrong because Hitchcock got great results with his method and other people with, with pure improv got great results. And, and I think it's, you know, it's part of the variety of filmmaking is that you can come up with great films using a number of different methods. And I suppose what, what ultimately is it's, it's about is what's right for the story. Yeah, exactly. Some, some stories are more improv, especially comedy. Comedy always benefits from improv. And if you've got Robin Williams and you're not planning to do improv, then why are you hiring Robin Williams? Um, whereas other things, I think especially complex thrillers, you really do need to hit all those story beats in the right way uh, because you change one thing and it throws the whole plot out. And um, you mentioned backstory a little bit earlier on. Do you give your story a backstory before we even get to the first, the, you know, the first scene? Oftentimes, um, but anything that is important for the audience to understand the plot and to empathise with the characters has to be in the story somewhere. So if you're cutting backstory out, any backstory that's crucial is going to need to be in the movie. And if you have too much important backstory, then you almost have this dislocation where you're constantly telling the audience about something that happened before the movie started. And after a point, the question raise, is raised, well, then why didn't you start your story earlier? <laughs> um, you, you always try and start your story as late as you possibly can, but, but be, just be aware of how much backstory you're leaving, because the more you are, the more explanation, the more it's going to sort of slow down in the movie. And I've, I've had projects where we've sort of had to calibrate that and what, what came before and what we bring into the movie. And is, 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 is screenwriting for you a, a journey? Um, it's a journey in the sense that I hope I'm a better writer now than I was when I started. You're always learning from other screenwriters and other scripts you read. Every time I read a script I see a few little tricks and a few little words that I love that I want to incorporate somehow and vice, vice versa. I'm sure something I've written has inspired someone at some point. Um, uh, so yeah, I think uh, I, I, if I thought that I couldn't get better as a screenwriter then I'd probably be just directing from now on um, but I know that I can always um, I know I can always improve um, and that's exciting you know the thought that you can keep getting better um, is good because you get excited about what you might be able to write in five years and there are some things that I've written in the last few years that I know I wasn't in the right place to write to uh, to write in my in my 20s um, same with directing I remember reading Spielberg talking about Schindler's List that he sort of sat on it for a long time because he just knew he didn't have the maturity to make it and then he woke up one morning, obviously, and said, I think I'm ready. Um, so I think we all, as filmmakers, feel like that, that we, we make the movies that we feel ready to make at a particular time. Um, sometimes you're ready to make a movie and it doesn't happen. And, uh, and you move on and you mature and you get suddenly, because you've got more successful, you get the opportunity to go back and make that movie from 10 years ago. And you look at it and you think, you know what, I really love that. Um, and I really wish I'd made it then, because it would have been great, but I don't actually think I want to make it now. Uh, I don't think it reflects where I am right now. And, and that's always quite a painful thing, to leave sort of an unborn child creatively behind you, but probably the right thing to do. And, and when you finally, you know, you've got the final sort of fade out, what, what's the feeling like once you've finished your script? 
Is it, is it a feeling of elation because it's all done? Is, is there a sadness because you've spent so much time labouring all, all over of, it? All of the above. Um, I, I think the biggest highs of screenwriting, the first one is when you get the concept, the initial concept, and you're just like, oh my goodness, that's such a great idea for a movie. Uh, has anyone thought of that? No, it's, it's mine, it's my concept. Um, and you get really excited. And then I think you know, the next one is a, a little group of them during the writing of the script where you, you have real major problems in your story and you just get those sort of transcendent moments of solving a big plot problem. And that's kind of like opening a door into a hallway that has a hundred other doors off it. And, and you, you just get excited because you've been trying to get through this one door for a long time and it opens and then there's a hundred more. And that's great because you've got a lot more exploring to do. Um, and then the final one, yeah, is having the draft in your hands um, and reading it because sometimes you're so close up to the story that you actually forget um, whether it flows. And so when you print it out and you read it, uh, it gets, uh, there's just that feeling of excitement of reminding yourself why you got into the story in the first place. Um, and hopefully the next one is when you give it to someone and they say the same thing. Well, that, that was kind of like my ne next question, really. What, you know, what do you do with the script once it's complete? Do, do you need to get it copywritten first? What's, what, what's the next step in the process? Well, I mean, when I started out, you need to, to print out your script and, you know, go and drop it into someone's office. But these days you just email it off. So, um, you know, I just finish the script and PDF it and watermark it if I need to and send it off to my reps. And hopefully my reps don't don't get a heart attack when they read it. Um, and then and then you send it out, um, you know, or give it to a producer if, if it's an assignment job. And um, and we talk, we hear a lot about sort of optioning of scripts. Can you explain a little bit more what that means to the uninitiated? It just means a producer or an executive is paying money to rent your script for a period of time. Um, so you can option or you can buy. If it's a Hollywood studio, their pockets are so deep that they can just buy anything they want to. So they don't really option scripts out there, they just buy them. But in the UK, producers don't often have as much money and so they will option a script from you for 12 months and keep renewing it etc so they'll be paying you an option fee and also they'll be paying you a fee to write each draft of the script.